This podcast is for mature audiences. It contains graphic violence and adult themes. Listener discretion is advised. Realm presents Blood and Gold, starring Richard Cabral. Episode 12. 1853, San Jose, California. Even as the Western United States continues to run on horsepower, the age of rail has begun. In the United States, the Transcontinental Railroad Survey has been authorized by Congress, and the world's first passenger rail service opens in India. With the threat of the posse removed, I let most of my men travel back to Arroyo de Cantua. Antonia and Tres Dedos and I returned to San Jose, so Antonia could reassure her parents that she was alive and unhurt. We went first to the house I had bought, approaching it cautiously in case anyone had connected it with the Vallejo who tried to rob the bank and killed McGee in the process. Seeing no one watching it, we went in and found it empty with that particular feeling of a house that's been standing vacant for some time. We were all tired from the long days and nights in the saddle. I suggested that Antonia make us a meal while Tres Dedos and I rested. The city has plenty of restaurants. I am not your cook. She spun around and left the room, clomping upstairs with deliberately exaggerated footsteps. <laughs> that was the wrong thing to say, Joaquin. Está enojada contigo, primo. She's the best cook among us. All those years in the bakery. She knows that. <laughs> Knowing it and liking it aren't always the same. <laughs> I felt a knot in my stomach. Antonia was upstairs, probably waiting for me to come up and apologize. I would do that, but I had something else to discuss with her, and I didn't expect her to like it. Tres Dedos chose to stay downstairs, which I guess was the wisest course of action. Alone and anxious, I climbed the staircase with the somber step of a man headed toward the gallows. Antonia was in our room sitting on the edge of the bed. She'd taken off her boots, but otherwise looked the same as she had downstairs. I found myself hoping she hadn't brought the revolver up with her. Lo siento. I know you're tired too. We, we can go to a restaurant. Are you sure you didn't want to go with Manuel? If I didn't know any better, I think you two were married. He's my cousin and a loyal lieutenant, and I am your woman. Doesn't that matter? I sat beside her on the bed, put a hand on her leg. At first she froze, and I was afraid she would swipe it off. But she didn't. It does, Antonia. Tanto más. How much more? Antonia, my love, I, I don't think you should go with us anymore. When we're working, you... Working? You mean... Robbing? See, si. You think I should stay behind and camp and get lazy and fat like the other women there? Para nada. It's nothing like that. And I know you wouldn't. But it's too dangerous. We lost Gallego and Huerta. And others were wounded. I couldn't bear it if something happened to you. Am I not helpful? You seem to appreciate my suggestions. I do. And you are but perhaps you could help me plan, then stay behind where it's safe. Because I'm a woman? Because you're the woman I love. You love Manuel? That's not the same. And if he was killed, I wouldn't grieve in the same way. I couldn't say what I really felt. She got jealous when I mentioned Rosita, but I couldn't bear the thought of losing a second woman to violence. She met my gaze directly. If you're asking me to... I'm not asking you. I'm telling you. You can't be put in harm's way. I won't allow it. 
Her voice became cold enough to freeze the American River. You won't allow it. You're the leader of our band, Joaquin. You make the rules. But remember one thing. You don't own me. I love you. But I am my own woman. I didn't know what would come next. So I just kept my mouth closed. Now, where are you taking me for dinner? Someplace expensive? The next evening, I had another task I meant to carry out before leaving San Jose behind. I met briefly with a few of my local contacts during the day and found that Deputy Clark's favorite nighttime spot was a restaurant and a saloon called Weber's just off of Market Plaza. I directed one of them to watch Weber's and to let me know if Clark showed up. And around 11 that night, the spy rapped on my front door with the news. Tres Dedos offered to go with me. You're too easily recognized. I'll do this alone. I dressed in a dark suit, the clothing of a wealthy and imaginary Vallejo, and didn't even take a gun. Market Plaza was close enough to walk, but I realized I might need to get away quickly, so I took my horse and tied her near Weber's. A few people were eating in the restaurant despite the lateness of the hour, but only the saloon was thriving. Standing at the bar was the man I had come looking for. I knew who Clark was as soon as I spotted him. He was heavy set with a barrel chest and a gut to match. His nose was bulbous and threaded with red veins, and it jutted out over the red handlebar mustache that Antonia had described. His badge was prominently displayed on his shirt. I made a point of not looking at him as I bellied up toward the bar. I ordered a tequila, downed it, and ordered another. After the first few, I began to spill some of each drink onto the floor. I wasn't out to get drunk, (laughs) just to run up a big tab. After more than a dozen drinks and a few bought for the drinkers on either side of me, with whom he'd struck up conversations, I told the barkeep I'd had enough. I patted my pockets. I seem to have forgotten my money. I, I can bring it to you tomorrow. Clark, who'd been drinking since before I had arrived, had some difficulty standing up, but he stepped unsteadily to confront me, displaying his badge. Well, what seems to be the trouble? I'm afraid I didn't bring any money. It's so dangerous out there these days, with all the bandits and the law doing nothing about them. I've fallen out of the habit of carrying any valuables when I leave the house. Clark's expression shifted from mildly bemused to furious at my comment. Doing nothing? Huh. I guess you didn't hear about the fortnight I just spent on the trail of the bandit Joaquin. Drove him clean out of the state, didn't I, boys? Some of the men around him roared their agreement. I I apologize, sir. I, I hadn't heard. He must be quite the lawman indeed. Remember that come election time, if you're a citizen. Oh, I am. Sancho Panza at your service. He didn't recognize the name from Don Quixote. Well, Panza, what are we going to do about this situation? I ought to run you in for vagrancy. I have money at home, Sheriff. It's only a couple of blocks. I can go get it. Clark ticked his big head toward the barkeep who glowered at me. I don't think Sam wants to let you out of his sight. I blinked and looked up as if I just had a brilliant idea. How about you, deputy? A couple of blocks and I can give you the money for my tab? And perhaps a little something extra for your trouble? A couple blocks, you say? That's right. A quick trip. Lead on, Mr. Ponza. The crowd parted for us. 
I kept up a running patter, telling Clark some of the same lies I told the men at the bar. At the end of the first block, I turned to the right. The street here was dark, quiet, out of sight from the door of Weber's and anyone who might be lingering on the market plaza. I didn't see anyone in either direction. I faked a stumble and caught myself on Clark's shoulder, pressing him against the wall of the nearest building. <coughs> Excuse me, I, I think I'm a tiny bit drunk. <laughs> that makes the both of us. What's the saloon for otherwise? <sighs> Excellent point. I kept a hand on his shoulder and slid my knife from its sheath. Then I dropped the drunk act. I am Joaquin Murieta, and I've brought you here to kill you. Clark blinked twice as my words sank in. He reached for his gun, but I was faster. I rammed the knife guard deep into Clark's midsection, twisted it, and wrenched it to the side. Clark gurgled, still pawing for the gun on his hip, but his legs went slack. I knew if I let go, the deputy would fall. Instead, I withdrew the knife and drew the blade across Clark's throat. Drenched with blood, I lowered him to the ground, face down. Tres Dedos had told me how to cut off a man's head. It wasn't easy, and it takes a certain will. I knelt on Clark's back and sliced through the flesh and bone. Head in one hand, knife in the other, I retraced my steps to Weber's. I opened the door just wide enough to reach through and hurl Clark's head into the saloon. You threw his head into the saloon? What was that meant to accomplish? I was holding a war conference in my house, in Arroyo de Cantua. Tres Dedos was there, of course, along with Gregorio Lopez, Reyes Feliz, and Pancho Dominguez. And Antonia, who was the one asking the most difficult questions. I wanted to send a message to the other lawmen in California. And the message was to leave us alone or suffer the consequences. I am not sure they got the message the way you intended it. She was right about that. In the three weeks since Deputy Clark's killing, town and cities up and down the state had posted rewards for my capture or killing. Instead of making us all safer, I'd managed to get a price put on my own head. Es cierto. We might have amateurs after us for the reward. Bounty hunters. I say that any lawman who comes for us has to suffer, painfully and publicly. If we keep the professionals frightened, the amateurs will tread carefully. What about the other Joaquins? Should we do anything about them? I shook my head in answer to Reyes' question. Over the past few months, at least four other bandit leaders in California had started calling themselves Joaquin, whether or not that was their true given name. That only helps us. If one strikes in Santa Barbara on the same day that I strike in Volcano, then people think I'm a phantom, able to be in two places at once. And if some lawman or bounty hunter kills any of the Joaquins, people may believe he's killed me. So when I strike again, I'll seem to have risen from the dead. The more afraid of us they are, the better. So business as usual, mas o menos. I like to step up the pace. More robberies, more horses stolen. Let's amass as much wealth as we can while showing the authorities that they can't frighten us. I've heard about a place called Garden's Draw, a camp in the northern mines that discovered a rich vein. By all accounts, everybody there is stockpiling gold by the pound. I want to raid the camp with a dozen men or more and scoop up as much gold as we can carry. Pancho Dominguez cleared his throat. <clears throat> I turned my attention to the man. You have something to say, Lieutenant Dominguez. I used his old army rank on purpose to put the man off guard. 
he often seemed to consider himself more important to the operation than he really was. I'd like to know, Joaquin, what is the strategic purpose of this? Strategic purpose? <laughs> We're bandits. We steal. These people have found lots of gold. The purpose is to take their gold and make it ours. But to what end? To get rich. Isn't that obvious? <laughs> We're already rich. I've got more treasure in my tent than I've ever had in my life. But if you look around Arroyo de Cantua, you'll see that there are very few places to spend it. And then go to Sacramento City, or San Francisco, or someplace. Even the mining camps have cantinas and gambling parlors and whorehouses, as well as shops and restaurants. I mean, if you want to spend some, take a few days and pick one. The others sat quietly, listening, and I thought they better not be getting any foolish ideas in their heads. That's not my point, Joaquin. We're amassing all this wealth and just hoarding it away. Meanwhile, most Mexicanos in California are dirt poor, scraping to get by, children going hungry. We share our wealth with them whenever we can. A little here, a little there, but it's not a plan. It's not, as I said, a strategy. We could use our wealth to help all our people if we put some thought into it. Really, how could we do that? I'm not sure, but with wealth comes power, and with power comes the ability to do good for people. Now you're sounding like a politician, Pancho. We aren't politicians. We're bandits. I just know that in the army, the officers told us where to go, what to do, who to shoot. Sometimes they sent us forward to die, and we did it because we had to believe that the officers had a strategy in mind. I don't think you do, Joaquin. I think you're only interested in amassing more wealth, but not in doing anything useful for our people with that wealth. I'll tell you what, Pancho. When I want your opinion from now on, I'll ask you for it. Otherwise, I don't want to hear your voice. Is that clear? Dominguez crossed his arms over his expansive gut and studied me with narrowed eyes. He wanted to keep arguing. That was clear. But he didn't dare. I swept my gaze over the others to see how they were reacting. Of all of those who might have surprised me by agreeing with Dominguez, the last one I expected was Antonia. Pancho has a point, Joaquin. If we put some effort into it, we could gain real power in this state. We do have real power. We're getting more all the time. Right now, I'm mostly concerned about keeping the law off our backs and continuing to make Mexicanos richer and gringos poorer. If anybody has a problem with that, he can feel free to leave at any time. I was looking directly at Dominguez when I said the last part. He held my gaze for a few seconds, then looked away. The meeting broke up a few minutes later. Antonia and I retired to our room and closed the door. I had a nightly ritual, a rifle by the window, an ammunition pouch close by. Colt's revolver on a small table by the door with two spare cylinders already loaded. Bowie knife beside the bed and saber under it. Those things done, I turned to Antonia, who was half undressed. You can't talk to me like that in front of the men. They need to know that I am the boss, not you or anybody else. It undermines me. I am not one of your men. I am your woman. If I can't speak honestly, there's no reason for me to be here. Can't you speak honestly, but with more consideration for my position? It's not easy to lead such a large band. We're almost a small army now, and in any army, some men look for any chance to replace the generals. 
Antonia shed the rest of her clothing. Her body never failed to stir me, but the look she gave me was cold. What do you know about armies? You never fought in the war. My father and brother did, and so did Tres Dedos. But I was too young. Boys fought. Pancho fought. No menciones su nombre. He's finished here. Anyway, you know my father made me stay home to take care of the women. Somebody had to. Joaquin, you knew before you took me away that I speak my mind. If what you want in a woman is a decoration instead of a full partner and an honest one, then perhaps I should go home. Is that what you want? To get rid of me? You know it's not. But you seemed far away sometimes, even when we're together, like there are other things on your mind weighing on you. Is that a surprise? You're gone so much, and now you won't even take me with you when you go. I'm not a doll you can pick up and play with, then just sit on a shelf while you're away. I'm sorry it's so boring for you. You know what my life was like before. I was busy, working in the bakery. At nights there were parties, dances, restaurants, people around. Then you let me go along on robberies, and I loved that. Then you took that from me too. I never thought about it that way. Por supuesto que no. Of course not. Antonia pulled on a nightgown. She climbed into the bed on the other side and sat up with her back against the wall. I undressed, but she didn't look at me. There might be no love making tonight. What does that mean? You put me on a horse and took me away from the life that I had. You didn't think about what that would mean to me. I reached out and took her hand in mine. What do you want, Antonia? You're going to raid this rich camp you've been talking about. I don't want to be stuck here while you're being chased if you are. If you won't allow me to go along, it's better if I go home. At least I can see my parents and my friends. I miss them. I don't have time to take you back to San Jose. We have to leave for the north right away before they transfer out any of the gold. You ask what I want. I don't want to wait here where there's nothing to do. Either take me along or I'll... No! We've been over this. I told you before, you can't go out with us anymore. It's too dangerous. I don't get to decide what danger is too much. I'm the leader of this band. And what I say goes. And I say you stay back. At least let me visit my family then. Or is that too dangerous too? In San Jose, at least she would be safe and letting her go would make her feel like she had a victory. Or at least I hope so. Muy bien. I'll send a couple of men along to see you safely there. So stay in the house so if there's anything you need while you're there, they can provide it. You can stay there too. I'll stay with my parents. I don't trust your men when you're not around. Antonia, te amo. I wouldn't let anything happen to you. You love me. Claro que sí. She squeezed the hand holding hers. I felt her other hand on my thigh. When I looked at her, her expression had changed. The anger had gone, or at least dimmed. Her eyes were wide. Her lips parted. Prove it. I put my arms around her and drew her in for a kiss. Some aspects of life in the camps had changed since my mining days, but not this one. Sunday was a day of rest. Monday through Saturday were for backbreaking labor, working to eke out every flake of gold that could be torn from the earth. Sundays, miners patched their clothing, mended their boots, fixed their tools, hunted game. If there was a church nearby, some might have attended services. Garland's Draw wasn't one of the bigger towns. Spying it from a nearby hillside, 
I was reminded of the rough and ready camps I had found upon first arriving from Mexico. People lived in tents and hastily erected shacks set among boulders bigger than any of the homes. Not buildings of stone or brick. Fourteen mountain men surrounded me. Spring in Northern California was edging towards summer. It's a little larger than I expected. More tents. It's been a few weeks. Tres Dedos was right about that. Word from this part of the state had taken some time to reach me. During that time, the ranks of the gold seekers had grown dramatically. We should have brought more men. All of them. And leave Arroyo de Cantu unguarded. Just the women there. We don't have enough. We have what we have, Joaquin. Do you want to call it off? Go back home? I shook my head. I rubbed my forehead, trying to think. I'd imagine a sparsely populated camp with maybe two dozen miners and piles of gold. But from the looks of the place, there must be at least 50 or 60 men living here. We can't go in guns blazing the way we talked about. We'll have to be quiet, go house to house, and try not to let anyone sound an alarm. You mean, kill everyone in the first place, then move on to the next one and kill them too? That's not exactly what I was thinking. You think that when we rob the first place, the people inside will sit quietly while we go to the next? We can tie them up, gag them, knock them out, something. Some will have to die. Perhaps some, but not all. We didn't come here for a massacre. You're the boss. Don't forget it. We explained the new plan to the other men, then rode down the hill. A few of the men stayed behind the huge boulders with the horses. Out of sight of the small settlement, with orders to quietly deal with anyone who might happen to cross them. Tres Dedos and I, together with Florencio Cruz, who was two heads taller than me and heavily muscled, went alone to the nearest dwelling while others waited outside. The first few shelters went off without a hitch. We encountered two men in a shack and one each in a few tents. Whether intimidated by the guns, Tres Dedos knives or Cruz's sheer size, the men gave up their gold without a fight. In each case, I called two of the other men up at the end, one to carry the gold to the horses and the other to ensure the occupants silence one way or the other. The fifth place we approached was somewhat sturdier than most of the others. I suspected it belonged to one of the original miners who happened upon the rich vein. The door was bolted from the inside I told Cruz to kick it open. He reared back and kicked so hard the door flew off his hinges and crashed to the floor. Tres Dedos shook his head. <laughs> so much for doing this quietly. I shot him an angry glare and stepped inside, walking on the broken door. Two men had been sleeping side by side on blankets spread on the floor but they woke up at the rude entrance. One reached for a musket, leaning against the wall nearby. I was faster and snatched it away. We aren't here to hurt you. We just want your gold. Show us where it is and we'll be gone. The inside resembled many miners cabins I'd been in. If there was gold, I didn't see it. The miners looked at each other before the older of the two answered me got no gold. He might have been in his 30s, his companion barely in his 20s. Mining was no business for old men, but it quickly aged the young. You live here, in the best cabin on the draw, and you have no gold. <sighs> Why don't I believe you? If you can find any, take it. We don't have time to hunt. Florencio, the younger one, if you please. Cruz started forward flexing his huge hands. Before he even reached the young man, the older shot to his feet. No, don't hurt him. I'll show you. Be quick. Florencio is not a patient man. 
the older man stepped off the blanket onto a pair of floorboards uncovered by the general clutter. Stooping over, he gripped the corner of the board and lifted it up, setting it aside. Then he shoved the other one over, revealing a hidey hole under the floor that brimmed with sacks of what looked like nuggets and jars of dust. The young one joined his partner and together they hauled the gold up, handing it over to me and my men. I carried some to the door and summoned help and Mota raced to meet me. People heard the sound of the door falling in. You better come out here. Que pasa? Miners, coming this way. Armed? Some? Yes. I waved the rest of my men over and started handing off some of the gold as they arrived. Get this to the horses and prepare to hold off the miners. Apuranse. Seven men managed to carry the gold away. I quickly scanned for other weapons, seeing nothing but some mining tools a pick and a couple of shovels that could be used if necessary. I kept the musket in my left hand, thanked the miners inside, and stepped out over the remains of the door. Mota had been right. Other men from around the draw were converging, most carrying weapons of some kind. I estimated 20, but the others were still emerging from their dwellings and starting down a slope toward us. I transferred the musket to my right hand, with the pistol making it clear that I couldn't use either. I held up my left, palm out. Stop there. This has nothing to do with you. We're leaving. Then the younger miner burst from the cabin. They took it all. Every flight. Tres dedos sighed. <sighs> Should have killed them. Cuando tienes razón, tienes razón. The miners had stopped at my command but the young man's words inflamed them. The nearest was a hard-bitten sort, with a muscular forearm holding a musket of his own. His nose had been broken at least once. We don't much like thieves here, or any kind of Mexes for that matter. I dropped the musket and raised the coat, curling my finger around the trigger. Like I said, we're leaving. Not with American gold. These men wanted a fight, and they wouldn't stop until they got one. I didn't care for the odds, but a man had to play the cards he'd been dealt. I turned toward the young miner with the big mouth and fired a shot that caught him in the valley. Then I whirled back toward the armed miners and snapped off another at the one with the musket. This round struck the man just below his right eye, and he crumpled instantly. The other miners, armed with tools, charged, screaming raw, wordless cries. Most of those with guns hesitated, afraid of shooting their own. But a few got off shots that flew more or less toward me and my men, kicking up the dirt and shredding leaves on trees overhead. We had it easier. The approaching throng made for easy targets, and the miners ran headlong into a fusillade of lead. Some were struck two or three times and went down before they reached us. Others kept coming. Through the haze of white smoke, I saw a man wearing the tattered remnants of an American army uniform drop to one knee and sight down the barrel of a musket at me. I didn't have time to deal with him though, as another was rushing at me with an upraised axe, seemingly heedless of the three shots he'd already taken. Blood blossomed on his shirt and vest. I squeezed off one more, but the man ignored that as he had the others. Instead of wasting another bullet, I shoved up from a crouch, lunging into close for the axe to strike me. I slammed my skull into the man's chin, stopping his advance, and grabbed the axe handle. Using it as leverage, I turned my attacker so that he was between me and the sharpshooter with the musket. As we wrestled, the musket ball crashed into the axe wielder's head, showering me in blood and bone fragments. Finally, the man collapsed. I snatched the axe from the dead man's hand and swung it into the nearest miner. The sharp edge tore into the man's midsection. The injured man stood there for long moments looking at the wound, then fell forward and landed with a thud. 
That took the steam out of the miners, and the attack stopped as suddenly as it had begun. The people farther away from us simply fled the scene, heading for their homes or their shelter of the big rocks and trees. Those who were closer or locked in battle lowered their weapons. Some gave brief nods as if acknowledging defeat. A couple of my men seemed like they wanted to give chase or continue the fight, but I ended that with a gesture. Let them go. Hemos terminado aquí. Montemos y vayamos. I took a last look at the battlefield. Two of my own men were down, but at least nine of the miners had fallen, either dead or soon to be. Blood trickled down slope. Soon enough, anger would force some of the men out of hiding, and maybe they'd be better armed. It was time to go. You're listening to Blood and Gold, starring Richard Cabral. Blood and Gold is a Realm production in association with Stryker Entertainment. Realm, your portal to another world. Listen away. Blood and Gold stars Richard Cabral, based on the novel Blood and Gold, The Legend of Joaquin Murieta, by Jeffrey J. Marriott and Peter Murieta, Produced by Marco Palmieri, Fred Greenhalge, Kaylin West, and Haley Wagreich. Adapted for audio by Greg Cox. Directed by Fred Greenhalge. Executive produced by Molly Barton, Marcy Wiseman, Russell Binder, Peter Murieta, Julian Yap, and Richard Cabral. Historical notes read by Elena Ray. Spanish dialogue translated by Alana Grafham. Regional Dialect Coaching by Luis Armando Mercado Campos. Sound Design by Eric Mooney. Mixing, Mastering, and Additional Sound Design by Rory O'Shea. Audio Editing by Corey Barton. Original Score by Juan Carlos Enriquez. Music Supervision by Marcus Begala. Production Manager, Alexis Latshaw. Production Coordinator, Angela Yee. Casting by Sunday Bowling and Meg Mormon. Cover Art by Kendall Thomas. Executive in charge for Realm, Mary Asadolahi. Find more shows like Blood and Gold by following Realm on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or at realm.fm. <laughs>